uh, welcome here tonight. Um, thank you very much for joining us for tonight's presentation uh, on divorce and separation in the church, secondary loss and trauma. Uh, my name is Megan Ramore, and I am an assistant coordinator in ministries and outreach at the Archdiocese of Vancouver. Um, also providing support behind the scenes tonight are some of my colleagues in ministries and outreach, Faye McCready and Frederina Ho. Tonight is our fourth event in our online series to launch uh, the Archdiocese of Vancouver's Ministry to Divorced and Separated. And we will be sharing more about our upcoming events at the end of the evening. I know that some of you here tonight have been coming to several, if not all of our events, and we hope that they have been fruitful for you. Um, but if this is your first time here with us tonight, we are glad that you're here. Uh, tonight's presentation and Q&A will also be recorded and it will be made available on the Catholic Vancouver YouTube channel. Uh, before we begin the formal uh, presentation tonight, um, we're actually going to start with a short welcome video by His Grace Archbishop J. Michael Miller, and uh, he's the Archbishop of Vancouver. Uh, Faye, can you please roll that clip? This is a warm welcome to you who are taking part in this first gathering of the new ministry established by the Archdiocese of Vancouver, its outreach to those who are separated and divorced Catholics. I certainly want to assure you and assure you most firmly and sincerely how important you are to the life of the Catholic community, that you are an integral part of our community. We also want you to know that there's a journey of healing that many of you are undergoing and that in that journey there are people, many people, resources, many resources who will accompany you. But more than that, there are countless numbers in the Archdiocese of Vancouver who are praying for you. We're all part of this healing process. Each one of us in different ways needs healing and the divine mercy. And I'm so happy, so glad that you have reached out to be part of this new ministry in the life of our local church. Your healing is vitally important to us, but more than that, it's vitally important to the Lord himself. Praise God that you are on this journey and that you will have friends who are accompanying you and praying for you. Uh, so to echo his grace, thank you again for reaching out to be a part of this ministry. Whether you yourself are divorced or separated, if you're supporting somebody who is divorced or separated, or if you have been impacted by divorce or separation in some way, you are very welcome to be with us. Uh, so before I begin, and introduce our speaker tonight, um, we're actually going to begin with a prayer. Um, and just at the end, uh, we're going to be praying um, uh, the prayer to St. Helen. So I will be sharing that on the screen and you can uh, join in with me once we get there. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we praise you, we adore you, and we thank you for bringing us together here tonight. You know and love each one of us personally. You know those areas of our life where we are wounded, and are in need of your grace and healing, whether that be physical, emotional, or spiritual. We pray that our hearts be open to however you may be speaking to us tonight. And we especially ask for the intercession of St. Helen, patron saint of the divorced and separated, as we pray together. O holy and blessed St. Helen, you know well the pain of a broken marriage. You felt betrayal and rejection, sadness over your marriage ending, and anxiety for your family's welfare and stability. You know what it's like to rebuild your life alone and to align your sorrows with the true cross. Please pray for us and all who are affected by separation and divorce. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so now I will be introducing our speaker tonight. Uh, so Father Brian Duggan was ordained to the priesthood in 2011 for the Archdiocese of Vancouver. 
where he served as assistant pastor at uh, St. Mary's Parish in Chilliwack and later as vocations director. After five years of ministry, he began studying for a doctorate in clinical psychology at the Institute for Psychological Sciences, Divine Mercy University. And he anticipates completing this program in 2021, so next year. He has worked in outpatient settings with Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia, and a group practice in Frederick, in Frederick Maryland, which serves the seminarians of Mount St. Mary's Seminary. His dissertation is a cross-sectional analysis comparing levels of effective maturity among first and final year seminarians at St. John Vianney Seminary in Denver, Colorado. Um, so we do plan to have some time at the end for Father Brian to answer some questions. Uh, so we encourage you to enter any questions that you may have throughout the presentation into the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end. With that, please welcome Father Brian. Thank you, Megan. Thank you for that kind uh, introduction. Um, let me just uh, share my screen here one moment. Um, yes, it's, uh, it's been a, a little while away on studies um, from the Archdiocese, but uh, certainly looking forward to, um, to returning next year and, uh, and being back in ministry here in the diocese. <clears throat> so joy to be with all of you uh, this evening. Um, certainly, yeah, honored, honored to be with you. Um, I'm so encouraged by, by this ministry uh, and by your presence here, by so many who've, who've uh, joined in this and, 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 and earlier um, opportunities to, uh, to get together and kind of share experiences and, and, um, and prayer and, and um, an encounter with, with one another and, and with the Lord in the midst of our circumstances. And so, yeah, I just am so thankful uh, for you being here applaud you for your courage and um, just so convicted of, of how how the church how how uh, our community here in Vancouver I mean personally were enriched by your presence and and by your choosing to um, in the midst of, of whatever circumstances you may be coming from um, whether you yourself are, are experiencing separation or divorce or remarriage or you uh, are affected by by someone in that situation um, just how, how valued uh, you are, your experience um, is, and how much uh, I have to learn from you and, and look forward to hearing from you, especially in the latter half of our, our uh, time this evening. So I'm going to share some thoughts with you. I, I'm certainly not an expert um, in this area at all, um, but uh, I have some, some experience uh, working with some, some uh, clients and, and parishioners um, in, in uh, similar circumstances. And, um, and I'm, I'm sharing some resources as well um, that I've, I've uh, uh, relied on for, for much of the content uh, this evening. Um, <clears throat> so some of what you hear may be very familiar and some of it may, may not. Uh, some of it may resonate with your experience and some, and some may not. And so I'm just kind of offer this uh, to you as, as kind of some reflections and, uh, and invite uh, really all of us to be open to um, what the, the stirring of the Holy Spirit, what prompts, uh, what stirs in our heart um, as we, uh, we go through this presentation and then the kind of discussion Q&A uh, at the end. Um, just wanted to start by, by sharing um, uh, an experience that, that um, uh, I, I have had. So the, 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 the content today um, is primarily looking at, um, at some of the losses uh, experienced um, by those who are divorced uh, or, or separated um, with a particular attention to, to those in the church, um, those that are Catholic. And, uh, and some of the additional suffering that, that can occur along with or as a result of the, the divorce or, or the separation. Um, and I think that's something that, that, um, that doesn't get a, a, enough, well, certainly doesn't get enough attention. And sometimes we can easily overlook um, these kind of secondary losses um, that, that, you know, a community that maybe once was, um, was a strong part of our identity and our life uh, now can feel, um, we can feel estranged from because of our changed circumstances. So I was thinking of an experience that, that um, I know firsthand a, a family who uh, one of the spouses 
was divorced and, and remarried um, and in a second, um, second relationship and uh, had been asked by the usher at Sunday Mass to bring up um, the, the gifts, the offertory, uh, the, the gifts for the offertory. And uh, when the pastor uh, discovered this um, before Mass, uh, sort of de de invited the family from bringing up the gifts because they were they were not married um, in the church. And uh, just how um, you know, not just you know, I'm not speaking uh, of the motivations of the pastor, but just how painful an experience that that is, uh, and 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 how dreadfully common, um, whether it's kind of that explicit or, or more subtle, uh, there are, there are uh, very common experiences of feeling, uh, feelings of rejection, of not belonging um, in, in the community of faith, sort of being, being on the outside, and, uh, and just how, how hurtful and, and um, and painful that can be, in addition to the trauma already experienced uh, of, of the, the loss of the relationship. Um, and so, yeah, I just uh, so conscious of, of the experiences that many of you may have had, uh, perhaps similar, and, um, and just want to give space for that and, and to name it, um, to name that the pain that um, is so commonly experienced by Christian and, and Catholic uh, individuals in, in these kinds of situations. Um, what came to mind that uh, this image uh, on the screen here is uh, from the, the movie A Marriage Story that uh, came out last year on, on, uh, on Netflix. Very well acted, but uh, just a heart-wrenching tale. And um, I was quite moved, quite, um, it was just a painful, painful movie uh, in the sense of of how real the portrayal uh, of, of relational breakdown and and, um, and yeah, just it kind of evoked in me some of that that, that, that sense and so that, that image I saw of especially the child kind of caught in the middle, and what a what a powerful um, image that is of, of the children who often suffer so dearly also in in uh, cases of, of, of divorce and, and separation and. And, um, and how painful that can be for the parents who see their children uh, suffering and, and can feel helpless sometimes. And, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's, there's so much pain and so much suffering and, and so much bigger than just the, the divorce. And so I just wanna name that and kind of, kind of give space uh, for that uh, this evening. And turn to our Holy Father, uh, Pope Francis has spoken um, quite pointedly and repeatedly uh, on, on the, the necessity of the church um, reaching out to individuals uh, who have um, experienced divorce or separation and those who are remarried as well. And this quote I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read uh, from the general audience August 5th, five years ago. There's a need for fraternal and attentive acceptance in love and trust toward the baptized who have established a new relationship following the failure of a sacramental marriage. In fact, these people are not excommunicated. They are not, and they should never be treated as such. They are always part of the church. Pastors must demonstrate the willingness of the community to welcome and encourage the divorced and the remarried, that they may live and develop more and more their belonging to Christ and the church through prayer, listening to the word of God, go into the liturgy and with the Christian education of children, with charity and service to the poor and with commitment to justice and peace. I'm so grateful for our Holy Father's uh, reminder and his leadership in this area. And uh, just so conscious of, of um, uh, you know, there's many stories I think of, of pastors and, and communities being, being welcoming, but, but there are also many stories of of, of hurt um, for those uh, in, in situations of divorce and, and, and remarriage and just, just divorce and separation. Um, and I just, I feel also the need to, to, to acknowledge where that, is, where that has happened, where there has been uh, rejection or, or certainly lack of support um, and just how sorry 
I am. And kind of on behalf of, of um, all those who, who, who lead and are, are ministers in the church, you know, for, for our failures in those areas, um, to make you feel welcome, to make you uh, feel always a part of the church. Such a strong uh, word there from our Holy Father. Um, and so, yeah, just, just have a great sorrow and, and, and want to, to name that um, for the, the ways in which those representing the church and those representing the community may have contributed to the feelings of shame and isolation, rejection that are so common and so painful uh, in these experiences. Um, for, for most of the presentation this evening, I'll be borrowing uh, a great deal from this workbook uh, called A Fresh Start, Divorce Recovery Workbook. It's by uh, two Christian um, men, um, mental health professionals, and uh, comes highly recommended. A lot of Christian counselors I know uh, use this book. Uh, it's not uh, Catholic, but a lot of the content is very pertinent and very, very helpful. Uh, so I, I summarized some of it. Um, I've referenced it a lot throughout the presentation. So, so um, most of the content, you know, is not my own. It's it's a lot of it from uh, from this uh, this book by Burns and Whiteman. I highly recommend it if you if you um, are looking for kind of further reflection on some of the content from this evening. Um, this is uh, it's a workbook. It's it's kind of a guided um, journal entries and, and reflections, and, and uh, it's a very helpful uh, helpful resource. Um, and so the, the, there's talk in the title even this evening uh, about a divorce as a trauma. And, uh, and we might have different reactions to that. Uh, perhaps um, the word trauma can seem um, heavy, can seem uh, uh, perhaps to overstate things a little. And, and so it's helpful to look at, um, at a distinction that's made. You know, there's a lot of talk, especially in the mental health world, about uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and most of the time it's uh, in reference to uh, combat, to um, veterans who experience or exposed to, to near-death um, experiences and, uh, and their, their kind of psychological repercussions. Um, and so a, a lot of uh, the literature makes a distinction between a big T trauma, which would be that firsthand exposure to near-death experience, and a small t trauma, which has many of the same uh, dynamics, same uh, impact, certainly, uh, in, in our lives, uh, but may not be as kind of um, uh, obvious or maybe um, as, as popularly understood as a trauma. And so uh, don't be hung up on that word, but I just wanted to put it out there because it, there are some parallels that can be helpful in our understanding, you know, the impact uh, a divorce or separation can have in, in our lives. Um, and so uh, trauma can be also uh, related to the loss of a loved one, the, the death of somebody close to us or witnessing um, a, a death. And so it's helpful, it can be helpful to kind of com uh, use this as a comparison because in, in divorce there, there is a very real loss loss of a relationship. And in fact, as I, as I alluded to earlier, numerous losses. Loss certainly of this significant other, but loss of so many other relationships and changed relationships. And, uh, and so there's the primary loss and then the secondary losses, which, which can be things like um, not being able to go to the same mass time as I used to because my ex-spouse is there. Or... Um, or mutual friends who sort of find themselves kind of choosing between one or the other. And so there's a loss or certainly a change in those relationships. And so that's what I mean by, by primary and secondary losses. And now uh, trauma is, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, an experience of, of, of a significant uh, loss or significant event, adverse event. Um, where especially there's a loss of control. And there's an expert in, the, in this area, Bessel van der Kolk, wrote a wonderful book. Uh, it's called The Body Keeps the Score. And he talks about uh, the impact of trauma, I mean, physiologically, how it impacts, uh, it changes the body and, and the brain, certainly. 
Um, and he has this definition, he's giving an interview, and he, and he talks about trauma as something that overwhelms our coping capacities and confronts us with the thought of, oh my God, it's all over. There's nothing I can do. I'm done for. I might as well die. And so trauma has with it that sense of, of um, helplessness and being out of, con out of control, sort of something overwhelming my, my capabilities. And, uh, and there's all kinds of, of, of tra traumatic experiences that can have an impact in our lives. And, and th that it's helpful to give space to, to, to just sort of listen to what, what is stirring in us as a result of these very difficult events uh, that we've experienced. I found this uh, in an article I read online, um, looking at, at some of these PTSD symptoms that can result from divorce. And uh, perhaps some of these will uh, resonate more with you than others, um, but uh, they are all signs of, of having experienced a trauma and, and the ways in which that can change our lives. You know, being more irritated, um, uh, more prone to aggression, feeling isolated, overly negative uh, self self talk, self thoughts, decreased interest in activities, and uh, an increase in in risky behavior. And and so, it's it's really important to be aware of of where these dynamics might be present in our lives, and to kind of listen to what this is communicating. Because it can be easy to condemn ourselves to say, oh, I was just acting aggressively or uh, I, was, I was drinking too much or doing other negative behavior and to further kind of further the shame, get down on ourselves even more like, oh, I got to stop doing that. I, I got to be better. And it just contributes. It exacerbates that kind of negative self-talk. And, and so it's helpful to sort of pause, you know, time out, step back. Okay, what's going on here? Where, where is this coming from? And, uh, and just in to, to notice what, what, um, what is happening and, and why it might be happening in, a, in our lives. Um, and to know what we need. You know, the author of this, this handbook talks about, um, you know, what, what do you need to hear? What do, what do you find encouraging? And do you have people in your life that can say these things that are helpful to you? So I'm going to have throughout the presentation a few of these reflection slides, um, and they're just prompting kind of questions to sort of bring it home, you know, to move from from presentation mode to more kind of reflecting. Okay, where where does this resonate with me? And uh, and so this author talks about um, you know different ways that people can can try to help, and uh, sometimes it's like oh you'll be okay, everything's going to be fine, and that can be helpful for some people, but for others it can feel dismissive. It's like, well, did you really listen to me? Like, it doesn't look like it's going to be fine. It's actually really terrible right now. Uh, and that's not helpful. Or someone else could say, you know what? You just need a kick in the pants, quit moping, get out there, start living. And again, for some, at some times that, that might be helpful. But for others, that could be actually really hurtful. And, and kind of further the sense of self-blame of like, I really, if I were stronger, I'd be able to feel better. And, and do more. Or someone could say your present feelings are normal, understandable, you're not going crazy. Um, this kind of a, a, a listening stance uh, that can be, can be really helpful. And so just to know, you know what is helpful for me, and, and it can change from time to time, what is helpful for me right now? And do I have someone in my life that, that can, um, can speak that to me? So what do we do with trauma? What do we do with loss? How do we, um, how do we move forward, you know, so to speak? And, uh, which again, you know, I want to speak against that temptation. I just use that language, but of, of like that we, you know, this urgency, okay, I need to be doing something to get better. And, uh, and just to kind of pause and say, okay, when it confronted by a loss or a trauma, what's, what's helpful, what, what, um, what does movement towards health look like? And you're probably familiar with um, Kubler Ross's um, the stages of, of grief and the process of grieving. A lot of authors prefer that term process because stages can seem kind of linear. It's like now we're in the denial stage and then anger and we sort of 
march our way forward. Uh, whereas these different places are, are exactly that, they're places and grieving is a process and sometimes we'll move back and forth and sometimes we'll be in multiple places at once. And it's also very important to remember, it's not a formula. It's a process, not a formula. It's not, uh, you know, when, when uh, the author of this uh, handbook says, you know, recovery from divorce can often take two years or, or even longer. Um, we can hear that and say, well, okay, I'm, I'm 18 months in, I should be over this in six months. And, you know, it's, it's not, uh, I, sometimes we wish it might be, you know, kind of that formula, but uh, that's not how it works. Um, it's different for each person. It's different for each party in the separation. And so this evening, we're kind of going to go through these different places in this process of grieving, look at, at what this can look like um, with the specifically uh, going through divorce or separation and, uh, and, and some reflection on, on each of those. Um, and a really important question from, from the get-go is just the difference between being the active or the passive uh, agent in the separation. And now that doesn't mean uh, that, that someone's passive and, and, and kind of not making an effort. That's not what that means. It really is a question of kind of who initiates the divorce and, and who receives that, that knowledge uh, or that, that yeah, being informed of it. Um, and, and that can change, you know, at different times uh, in the process of, of going through the divorce or the separation. But it, it, it's important to just to, to kind of reflect on, okay, who was I in that? Because the grieving process is a little bit different. If I have initiated the divorce or the separation, I've started the grieving process long before I ever brought up the topic uh, with my spouse. Uh, for the other party, that's not the case. And it can, it, it's just starting with kind of being informed of, of this possibility. And the author has this, um, put together this, this uh, graph which which just looks at some of those different elements but the the, the primary um piece of it is that the you know the the grieving period you'll notice for the passive agent starts much later it starts after uh, or towards the end of the period of termination whereas for the active agent that period started a lot uh, a lot sooner and so it's it, it can be helpful just to reflect on that because we can perhaps experience the other party as callous. If we're the past, if we're the receiving this news and the other is confronting us with it, they could seem callous when in fact they've been in this process a long time already, uh, or perhaps we're the one who's been in this process a long time. And so it's just helpful to, to think about, you know, who, who was I in that process? Where, where was I and did that change? Now, what are my beliefs about marriage and how does that contribute to, um, to the experience of, of separation? Um, the author shares his own testimony and talks about believing that God would protect his marriage from divorce because he was serving him. He was a pastor. He was a very faithful evangelical Christian, a traditional Christian, and, and really felt that divorce only happened to bad people. And since he and his wife were good people, they were safe. What was your experience? Was that a, a belief that resonates with you? And the flip side, does it, does it mean that, that, or is there the, the presence of that sense that, that only, uh, only bad people or bad Christians get divorced? And do I, you know, was I perhaps taught that as a child and believed that and, and, and is that present in the experience of grief and suffering that, that is uh, arising from my experience with, uh, with separation. And how does that impact our relationship with God? You know, if, if I have this sense that the God is going to, uh, I'm serving God, I'm living a faithful life as a Catholic, and I got married in the church, and, and people who do these things don't get divorced, and now I'm divorced. What does that mean about God? Does that mean he's not holding up his end of the, of the bargain? Uh, what does it mean about me? Does it change 
what I think about myself? Does it does it mean that somehow I I have failed? I'm 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 really to blame for this relationship uh, breakdown. Now the first uh, place, rather than kind of using the word stage, the first place is denial. This idea that it'll never happen to me. I'm following this formula. I've committed my life to God, put him first, he will bless me. And then divorce comes out of nowhere. And, and it can be just so shocking and so disruptive. Um, the author talks about his experience uh, in church where he would look at other couples and see them with problems in their marriage and little by little notice them not coming to church as much as they used to. And then he would say to himself, you know, uh, and then he would hear that they, they ended up separating and, and there'd be some part of him that would say, well, that figures, that's what happens when you fall away from God. There was this belief that you do the right things, you'll be okay. And you don't do the right things, and that's when uh, breakdowns can happen. Well, the author's own divorce just shattered that, that belief system, and denial was kind of the immediate reaction. Denial can be uh, just a sense of, yeah, this, this never happened to me, um, or this can't be happening right now. Um, and, and it can take different, different forms, different language. But there is that, that feeling of being numb. And denial is not entirely bad. You know, it can be helpful. It's, it's sort of uh, uh, like the body going into shock. It, it can give us a little bit of space to, to respond or to, to, to adjust um, uh, before experiencing strong emotion. Um, but it, it, can be, it becomes harmful if we stay in it, if we're stuck in it. Uh, for a long time. And so it's just, you know, it's just helpful to reflect, you know, where, where may denial be present in my life? And this is a um, silly comic, uh, offer a little levity. Uh, denial is the first stage of, no, it isn't. Uh, perhaps the denial is not so present uh, in our experience or so obvious, but, uh, but where is it present? Where uh, the author offers this um, uh, little, little reflection on, uh, on different forms of, of denial, you know, um, or, or yeah, belief, sort of some of these subtle beliefs that we can hold on to. Um, you know, good people don't get deserve, uh, divorced. God generally gives us what we deserve. That can be such a, such a, a punishing, severe belief. That God gives us what we deserve and I'm, in, I'm suffering, I'm separated, I must deserve this. Oh, that is such a, such a deep, deep and hard place to be. Um, yeah, just to kind of uh, browse through these. Is, is there something that stands out to you? What's stirring in you? You know, is God punishing me because of this divorce? If I pray hard enough, my marriage will be saved. My spouse has walked out on me. I must have done something wrong. Am I questioning God's goodness in response to the divorce or the separation? The next place of, um, of this process is anger. And anger, first of all, uh, just to acknowledge that anger in itself is not a sin. And, and we, we can tie ourselves in knots around this a little bit because, of course, in every examination of conscience, you'll find uh, anger as a part of the reflection. But anger in itself is an emotion, and emotions are themselves not sinful. They arise spontaneously. They arise without our choosing them, and where there is no choice, there is no sin. And so a feeling is not sinful. Our response to that feeling is where vice or virtue can enter in, um, but, but the intensity of the feeling also um, uh, affects our culpability, our, our, you know, how, how culpable we are of, of whether or not the action is sinful um, or, or not. And so just to, to name that and to acknowledge that if when I'm acknowledging anger, it's not necessarily 
acknowledging sin. Um, and there's always a relationship between fear and anger. Now, anger is often a secondary emotion, a response to a more primary emotion, and, and oftentimes it's fear. And it can be a fear of, of judgment of others, uh, a fear of uncertainty about the future. Um, and, and in that place of anger, there can be a quick movement to blame. You know, that this, this terrible thing is happening, this enormous place of suffering that I'm experiencing, there must be someone to blame. Perhaps myself, or my spouse, or someone else. Um, there can be a lot of anger towards the church, you know, if for, for feeling let down or, or even actively rejected. Um, and so just the invitation here is just to be aware of, just to name those places um, where we are experiencing this anger. Anger can come out in different ways. It can come out as rage, as sort of this overwhelming um, uh, expression of, of anger at, at anyone and anything. Um, anger can be repression. It can be uh, holding it in. It can be repressed and, 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 and um, sort of a fear even of expressing it. It can be redirected into other things. But the goal ultimately is, is resolution to sort of resolve that which is driving the anger. The author has these kind of um, uh, comics that he, he puts together. This is from the book, so the resolution is not great, but uh, you see it's sort of like an x-ray of, of this woman. She's like, my divorce, no problem. I handle it just fine. But the x-ray is showing just this fire burning inside of her. And that's, that's a common experience, especially among good, polite Christians. We have the, the face, the facade, of doing fine, uh, but the internal world is just just uh, on fire, and and so is that present for me? Do I need to to acknowledge that? Here we have a comic of redirection. The woman is uh, um, knitting a sweater. She's like, I had so much angry energy, I decided to knit a sweater, and uh, and there you see in the second slide, it's uh, you know about ten feet long. It's been redirected. Now again, it may seem that's probably a pretty healthy uh, way of, of expressing anger, um, but but it doesn't resolve it. it it's, a, it's another way of kind of avoiding. And so, unfortunately, um, you know the, the the movement towards resolution requires naming and facing the anger. And so, just to reflect, who with whom am I angry? Where is this present? And how angry? on a level of you know, one to 10, to my spouse, my ex, friends or former friends, family, church, God, yourself, others. Where am I noticing this in my life? And again, anger is not sinful and the expression of anger towards God can be such a powerful prayer. And it can be anger towards God. God, I'm really angry with you for letting this happen. Or it can be expressing all these other angers as well. And it's just a beautiful prayer to say, Jesus, I am so angry at my spouse. I'm so angry. But it's so important this Jesus, I am angry. It's relational. It's addressing Jesus and it's naming my own experience. It's a beautiful and powerful prayer. A very common sentiment in the Psalms, the Psalms that often express such anger uh, towards God. Um, and their whole range of, of emotion. And here we just have a quick example of resolution of anger, where instead of repressing it or acting out in rage, it's acknowledging the source of the anger, which is a feeling of rejection from this friend, and just expressing that to the friend. We used to do a lot of things together, but since the divorce, it seems like you've been avoiding me. It's been really rough. I've, not, I've, I've felt angry, felt that you've been shutting me out. Uh, I'd like to patch things up. How can we do that? Um, it's it's a, a, a very honest way of engaging in, in relationships. The next place after anger is, uh, or in addition, or, um, is bargaining. And bargaining is best defined as trying to find a simple solution to a complex problem. We want it solved right now. 
Uh, the author talks about, it's like using a microwave for a crock pot recipe. It's just wanting it to be done now. And so it's a, trying to short circuit a solution. And so where this is present, where I'm experiencing this, it's just helpful to name, to be aware. Okay, this is, this is what's happening here. I'm making this bargain with God. You help me through this, just solve this difficulty, and I'll do X, Y, and Z for you. Um, and just to name that and to, to acknowledge where, where that's present in our experience. I'm just going to move a little more uh, quickly here. But just to reflect, where, where has that been present? Have I bargained with God? How has that impacted my relationship with him? How am I feeling about him right now? Some of these can be signs uh, that I'm in a kind of bargaining relationship with God. I'm feeling cynical or doubting. Again, not a judgment, it's not a condemnation, it's just an acknowledgement. Oh yeah, I'm noticing this in myself uh, and this is hard. The place of depression. Now again, and this is so important, depression is not a sin. Feeling sad is not a sin. I think, you know, in the language that, that um, we hear sometimes from the saints or in presentation of the church, it can be easy to, to think, you know, the joy of the gospel, the, the joy, the good news, that, that is, it's sort of a Christian must always be joyful, and when they're not, they're sinning. And it's, it's okay, okay, pause, have that in context, and just be aware, first of all, that emotions arise without our choosing them, as does sadness and depression. And it's, it, sadness can be um, a, a place, a stage, a, a, a moment uh, before movement. If you've seen the, the there's a great um, animated movie, um, Inside Out, and uh, you know, the basic kind of resolution of the, of the main conflict in, in, the, in the story is the recognition that sadness is actually vital, that sadness is a necessary experience in order to move towards a solution. And, and that is not to stay there forever, but, but to stay there for a moment is, is actually life-giving. Uh, and this can seem so counterintuitive and, and certainly all the more so sometimes uh, for us as Christians. Um, but there's something about, about uh, depression that is based in reality. You know, the author describes his, his period of depression as the first moment when he was dealing with reality as it was, where he was sort of actually confronting and no longer denying or pretending that he could reconcile with his wife and bargain with her, bargain with God. It was just this conf confrontation with reality and that it was out of his control, that he was helpless, couldn't change his wife, his life, his work, and he couldn't handle it by himself. And he wasn't yet at a place of being able to draw close to, to God or to others. Um, and so where, where might this be present for you? What are some of the signs perhaps that you're experiencing uh, some of this um, these, the sadness or these depressive symptoms? Trouble sleeping, weight gain, weight loss, apathy, um, physiological. You know, the depression can often manifest in, in, uh, in our physicality with stomach issues, GI, um, uh, uh, even susceptibility to, to other illnesses, loneliness, uh, concentration difficulties. And so this is a helpful kind of quick list just to sort of look at the ways in which depression might be present in my life and affecting, affecting me. And then there is hope. Of course, there's always hope. We move uh, now to the place of acceptance, which is just easier said than done. Um, but it, it can be described as a place of, of holy detachment, holy indifference. You know, it's really important to, to, to understand what is meant by this. It's not um, the indifference of apathy um, and, and, and not a, um, a forced asceticism or a forced kind of stripping of ourselves, of everything that makes up our lives. This is not what the Lord is asking for. It's not holy. Um, but this place of acceptance is, is, is a place of freedom, ultimately. It's a place of 
of adaptability and, and an openness to, to how God is present in our circumstances. And, uh, and so it, it, it can man be manifested, the signs of, of being in this place of, of acceptance uh, is when I, I, I spend uh, less time uh, fantasizing about, um, you know, my anger or my being hurt, um, where I can perhaps encounter even my ex. Now this is, you know, in context and not everyone, um, this is not perhaps the, the solution for everyone or the place that everyone um, arrives at, but, but it, you know, perhaps encounter my ex and not uh, lose my peace, um, where I, I, can, I can feel less responsibility for, for, uh, for this person who's hurt me. Um, acceptance is, is this place of freedom. And this beautiful quote from uh, Jacques Philippe in the School of the Holy Spirit uh, captures much of, of this, this disposition of the heart that, that is a holy, holy detachment, uh, holy indifference and acceptance of, of sometimes very difficult situations, very even unpleasant. I can, I can choose uh, or come to a place where I, I don't lose, lose my peace uh, over them. And so uh, the author offers um, a few additional considerations and just talks about the very real experience of loneliness. And what do we do with this? And he kind of asks the question sort of sardonically, kind of hypothetically, what's the cure for loneliness? Being with people, of course. But uh, often that's actually not the cure. And there's nothing more lonely than being in a crowd of people and feeling totally alone. The party going on around you, but you're not part of it. You, you may even be talking and laughing with people, but inside you're thinking, they don't really know me. I don't belong here. And so loneliness is so much more than simply the presence of people or relationships in our lives. The, the movement uh, away from, from an unhealthy loneliness is to a place of believing myself to be worthy of belonging, worthy of relationship, worthy of love. The author talks about communication and just how in his own reflection on where he was dumbfounded, he was blindsided by, by his wife walking out on him, he slowly came to realize that, that he probably was not communicating very well with her long before that moment when she left and, and that, that's probably an area for him to grow in. And so he talks about just the importance of kind of learning how to, to communicate well in other relationships, uh, in all of our relationships. And for him in particular, he noticed this tendency to avoid conflict, to avoid difficult conversations. And so uh, just recognizing that as an area um, of growth, an area um, to, to sort of challenge himself and, and and move towards towards being a, a, a more open, a more uh, more forthright uh, communicator. Self control without condemnation. This is such a delicate balance. You know, the, the life of virtue to which we are called in our Christian faith it can often be presented in language of self condemnation when we're not there yet, when we're not as virtuous as we should be. And so, again, this is such a sacred place and, and, and a place of encounter with the Lord, just to openly acknowledge our weakness, uh, the ways in which we perhaps have taken our needs to unhealthy places, just to name that, acknowledge that, um, seek forgiveness and, and come to, um, to the Lord with that where, where, where necessary, where possible. Um, and then to pray for that grace of, of movement towards authentic virtue, a virtue that's based in a, in a healthy knowledge of self and, and love for self, seeing ourselves as God sees us. And then the reality of bitterness. Bitterness, again, is such an unpleasant emotion. We can often feel a lot of shame attached to these feelings of bitterness and, and just how important it is just to name it. Name it when we're feeling it, acknowledge it, acknowledge that reality, and then pray for that grace to move towards forgiveness towards a place of, of genuinely desiring the good of the other. 
And I'll end here with a, a final quote from the beloved Holy Father. I just love that image of him, his arm around this uh, the child with, with cancer. Um, just this fatherly presence that he has. I felt so, so loved by his fatherly heart. Um, and, uh, and I know he has a special heart for, for those in difficult situations. And he said, the baptized who are divorced and civilly remarried, this is from Amoris Laetitia, his um, uh, response to the, the synod on, of the bishops on, on the family. Um, the baptized who are divorced and civilly remarried need to be more fully integrated into Christian communities in the variety of ways possible without avoiding, uh, while avoiding the occasion of scandal. This logic of integration is a key to their pastoral care, a care which would allow them not only to realize that they belong to the church as the body of Christ, but also to know that they can have a joyful and fruitful experience in it. They are baptized. They are brothers and sisters. The Holy Spirit pours into their hearts the gifts and talents for the good of us all. And just to, to end on that note, uh, a great reminder from our Holy Father that you belong in a church and this is your home. And you are our brothers and sisters and you have gifts and talents which are, um, uh, which are for our good and we are impoverished um, when, when those are not uh, celebrated and, and given proper place. And so um, just, yeah, just to know the heart of the church for you in these difficult circumstances of, of your life and, um, and that the Lord is so close to you and loves you and is drawing you always uh, closer to him. Good, just a few uh, references. Um, as I mentioned, the, the main book is that, that first item there, the Fresh Start Divorce and Recovery Handbook. And, um, and then a few other articles and, of course, the words of our Holy Father. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and uh, I think turn it back over to, uh, to Megan and we'll have some time for a little discussion. Yeah, so thank you very much for uh, that presentation, Father Brian. I'm, I'm sure it resonated in, in some way with everybody here. Um, I know one thing that I kept hearing throughout your presentation was just that importance of naming, of naming what you're feeling, whether that's hurt, whether that's anger, um, betrayal, what, whatever, just how that acknowledgement can 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 give power um, but then of course also turning to prayer after that for for the grace to move through it and of course through those beautiful words that you shared both at the beginning and at the end um, by pope francis and just that reminder that we're all still part of the body of christ in some way no matter our woundedness our, our brokenness we're all we're all in need of healing in some way and, and um, yeah yeah Thank thanks you yeah. so much um, so we do have a couple questions. Let me just uh, pull them up here. Uh, so one question uh, that we have is, uh, my family is judging me and placing blame on me. How can I get past the place of anger or depression with my family relationship heavy on my heart and on my mind? Mm. Gosh, yeah, that's so, that is so hard. I um, can just hear the the... The pain uh, behind those words and, and, uh, and my heart goes out to you. Um, yeah, um, you know, we can, we can struggle with these um, uh, beliefs, these false beliefs uh, we talked about earlier in the presentation, the sense of self-blame or, or of, um, of shame. And we can believe these things about ourselves and be laboring under these, these painful and harmful um, uh, negative uh, self-beliefs um, and then to hear those words said to us by people that we love people who should be accepting and supporting of us whether it's our family or our church I mean just the, the added pain of that I, I, it's just so um, it's so real and I just so appreciate the question and kind of naming that again just just, yeah, just naming it is so naming it has the has it helps in uh, by acknowledging it, it does, it saps some of the power, it takes away some of the, the power, but those words still sting. And, and I think the, the key in all of this is to hold on to the truth. And what is the truth? The truth is that we are all wounded and broken and, um, and we all, uh, of course, have, have some fault 
in some way, um, but that that does not change who we are. The deepest reality of who you are is a beloved child of God. He loves you. He knows you to be good because he has made you and called you good. And that is who you are. And nothing that, that um, is said by, by others uh, can change that. Um, it, uh, it is probably not helpful or, or even really possible to engage in an argument about that or to, to challenge that. And, and sometimes the best thing we can do is just to have some space whether that's physical space, which is harder in our present circumstances sometimes, uh, and certainly emotional space. You know, if, if somebody is continuing to hurt me with their words, then it can be a really safe, uh, a really um, a courageous and, and, and loving thing to do to not, not give them that space, to, to kind of separate myself from them a little bit of, you don't have the right to, to say these hurtful things about me. And, and so what, whatever that looks like, maybe it's setting up some boundaries, maybe it's less frequent contact, maybe it's ending conversations that are hurtful, um, you know, uh, but, but some, some way of kind of expressing just perhaps just to myself, this truth about who I am um, and who I am in, God, in God's eyes. Thank you, Father. Um, we have a question here too, um, how, to, how to help the pain we feel in seeing our children suffering mm -hmm. as a result of uh, the separation or divorce. Yeah, that is such a uh, such a commonly felt um, experience, and, and uh, I appreciate that that question so much. Um, and there's no there's no denying it that the, the divorce and separation is is very hard on children. Um, and uh, and it can be so hard as a parent to see this, to see that that my um, that the, the breakdown of, of my marriage is, is having this, this impact on my child. And um, yeah, there's, there's much that could be said. I, I think one of the most important things is to, it's kind of a negative way of saying it, but, but avoid as much as possible um, situations that put, put the kids in the middle. Um, you know, a lot of children of divorce talk about this experience of, of one spouse, one parent talking negatively about the other parent to the child. And, you know, it's so, so natural and, and, and we have strong and intense feelings um, and sometimes really hurtful things are done by the other person. And so this can be, it can be really hard to avoid, but, but that's, um, that's something that, that can be really uh, helpful is to just, um, preserve the child from that as much as possible. Um, and the other thing that a lot of research and, and literature is, is showing is, is just to talk about it. Talk about the divorce, talk about the separation uh, as matter of factly as possible and as age appropriately as possible with the child. You know, it can be an added suffering for a child to feel like this is not safe to talk about. This thing which is hurting me so much and which I'm carrying so much from, I'm not allowed to talk about with my parents because, because it's, it's hard for them. And of course it's hard. Of course it's hard for, for mom and dad. Um, but but if, if that's something that you are, think you might be capable of, that can be really helpful. Uh, it just to, for the child to know that it's okay to talk about, that they can, they, they can bring their, their pain to you and you can hear it and without, without collapsing, as painful, as, hardful, as hard as it is to hear, just to offer that to them can be such a healing experience to know that, that they're safe in bringing that pain to you. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, that, that you can bring it to someone else that, you know, that, that um, cause that's, that is of course hard to hear, but that you can bring that to someone else, to someone not your child uh, to be able to talk through. Yeah. I hope that that's a helpful uh, a few points. Um, so we have another question here from um, somebody who was the person who, the, the spouse who initiated the divorce, um, and they still feel regret and guilt over the choice, even though it was the best choice at the time. Uh, so how can they get over that feeling of mm -hmm. guilt? Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I just want to kind of acknowledge the, um, how, uh, how normal that experience uh, is and, and, and that it's not, um, yeah, that it, it's not an unusual uh, experience. And, and, and I think even as you say in your words, it's not, not a sign that the wrong decision was made or, or, or anything like that, that of course, of course we have mixed feelings. And of course, when we see the, the, the fallout and the pain, um, uh, it, uh, it can, can, can bring about the feelings of, of guilt. And, and so um, again, just, just to, to acknowledge, to normalize, to say, yes, yes, I am feeling this right now. I see the hurt that is caused. I see perhaps how it's affecting our children, and I and I just have such guilt. Um, yeah, I think just naming it is huge. Just acknowledging it um, does kind of reduce some of the sting, some of the power, and then uh, and then bringing it to God. You know, it's just so such a powerful prayer to, to to just say, God, I am feeling this way. I'm feeling so guilty about X, Y, and Z. I'm feeling so. Um, so much uh, shame, guilt, um, uh, disappointment with myself, just to, to, to bring it to the Lord um, in that kind of relational prayer is so powerful and so important. Um, and yeah, I, I think, yeah, just to, just to normalize that experience for, for, for you, that, that, that this, that of course, one would feel this way. It's such a traumatic experience going through divorce. It causes so much disruption and in the sense that, that I have done this. If I had not done this, this pain, this trauma would have, uh, would have not occurred. And then just to, to invite the truth into that where, where okay, yes, however, or, or in addition, there was already pain. There was already uh, hurt in the relationship um, that led to the, the, the decision to separate. And so I am not the source of all of this pain. It's very mutual. It's very, um, it was very much present before this decision. And and so it, it is a little bit of sort of like speaking the truth to ourselves, but it's, it's just allowing to kind of see this in the fuller context of, of just the, the, the messiness and the brokenness of, of the reality of my circumstances. Um, so we actually have a question here from somebody from the other perspective. So somebody who's um, uh, their, their ex-spouse was the one who initiated the divorce. Um, and uh, they have gone through um, all the stages of grief um, and they're now at the point of forgiveness um, and feel sorry for their ex-spouse because um, they're not getting the support or understanding from their family because they are also Catholic. Um, is there anything that this person can actually do or should do to help their um, ex-spouse? The, the ex-spouse is not getting the support from, uh, their, family. from their own family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, gosh, that's so hard. Yeah. I mean, it's such a beautiful, I'm so moved by those words and, and, and just, yeah, the, and I can, can hear kind of that, that, you know, the journey and that, that the coming to that place of forgiveness of, and of acceptance is, is earned by, by many tears and by much, much hard work. Um, and so I just want to name that, acknowledge that. Um, yeah, the, um, It's such a, um, this, this place of holy uh, indifference that Father Jacques Philippe was talking about is, is such a mysterious place, right? Where, where, because it is also a place of love. And I'm hearing that in the question, this love for the ex-spouse, that, that uh, coming to this place of acceptance, of forgiveness, and wanting them to be suffering less, wanting greater uh, freedom and healing for the ex-spouse. That's such a, a loving um, uh, disposition, um, but this, th this kind of, yeah, the, the reality of the circumstances, you know, this is, of course, just speaking very broadly, not knowing the specifics of, of the, the circumstances of the question, um, but, but broadly speaking, 
you know, this is, this is a place of holy detachment where much like a parent who is witnessing uh, a child make choices and, and go down a path that they desperately don't want the child to go down, that, that, it's, that they see the hurt that, uh, that is coming their way, uh, but is, is often helpless to change that because the child has, has freedom, has free will. You know, the, the, often the advice that I hear in such circumstances is, um, is just that gentle reminder that, that Jesus loves your child even more than you do. And there's a, there's a surrender in kind of giving your child over to the Lord to say, I can't, can't force him to be different. I can't, you know, I've tried. I have tried to convince him otherwise, but I, I just can't. Um, you know, I give him to you, Jesus. And, uh, and I think there's perhaps a similar invitation here with, 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 um, with the ex-spouse to, to, to desire healing, to desire freedom, to desire support and acceptance from, from their family, um, and to just offer all of that to the Lord. Because the Lord loves your ex-spouse uh, even more than you do and desires uh, their freedom even more, more than you do. Uh, and and he's the the ex-spouse is in the Lord's hands. Uh, he will he will take care of him. Yes, this question here is um, uh, says my friend is divorced and civilly remarried. Her current husband, who is not Catholic, is also divorced, uh, but has mental health challenges which means that going through the annulment process would be detrimental to his mental health. So what can her friend do to accept that she will never be able to receive communion at mass, yet still feel accepted within the church community and accepted by the church? Yeah, gosh, there's a lot there. <clears throat> um, that's such a, such a painful situation. Um, I think that that uh, yeah, I'm kind of drawing drawing back to um, the words of Pope Francis and just how uh, how you very mu how your friend very much is a part of the church, and um, and regardless of of what happens with with the annulment or with the civil uh, civil marriage, um, you know she uh, she belongs. Uh, in the community, she is a child of God, and um, and she has gifts uh, that that community um, needs from her. It was is impoverished by by their absence, and so she's very much a part of 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 that church community. Um, I uh, again, not knowing the specifics, um, I I would just uh, encourage. Um, and perhaps this has already already been done, but just to, you know to to really um, bring this as much as possible to uh, to the, the the people in the church that might be able to help, um, whether it's the pastor. Perhaps it sounds like already some conversation has happened with um, the marriage tribunal about the annulment. Um, you know, it, it may be possible that something could be arranged that 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 would be. Um, uh, protective of, of the um, former spouse's mental health. Um, you know, I think the, the, the diocese and the church in general is really um, emphasizing the pastoral um, uh, care uh, for, for individuals in this circumstance. And so it, it may be possible to find a path forward. And so I would certainly encourage your friend to, um, to pursue that if, if she's if she's not already, or if, or, or if, or even just to bring her concerns to to the, the those uh, at the tribunal and see if there's something that could be done to to assist her her um, her ex-husband. Um, so that would be kind of a piece of, kind of concrete advice. Um, and then uh, and really just kind of challenge that there's um, uh, strong language in the statement. Um, that her friend will never be accepted in the church, and uh, and that's um, you know 
uh, I'm sure very much uh, her experience and I can, I can imagine an experience of, of, of being rejected and, and I've witnessed it even myself um, uh, happening to, to people in similar circumstances. And so, uh, so I, I can imagine that the pain and the suffering that's behind those words, um, but, but I, I, I'm drawing again, just to upon Pope Francis and, and that reality that, um, that they are, she is a part of the church and and deserves to be accepted, regardless of the outcome of the annulment. She she remains a part of that church community, with with gifts to offer and and who is a, a blessing and an enrichment to that community. Um, so we have another question from from somebody who, uh, who is a friend of uh, somebody divorcing. Um, so this person says, it is in my opinion that one of the, uh, one of the persons are being very difficult and hurting the other a great deal. Um, and this friend is, or sorry, it's hard to not to pick sides. Um, and this friend is also a godparent to their child and wants to help. Um, and both are seeking comfort from everyone around them. Um, professional counsel is needed, but they cannot afford it. Uh, I guess, how can they help how can they support in this situation um sorry i had a little bit of trouble uh, hearing you megan i'm oh, just re I'm just reading the question uh, myself um yeah no that's that's so hard when there's um um yeah that temptation to pick sides is, is so difficult uh and then where there is that relationship as a godparent as well, it's just an added complexity. Um, I mean, it sounds as though in that circumstance, perhaps the invitation is to be as much as possible a neutral party, you know, one who, who strives to, to remain um, a friend and loving to both parties, even though it, it sounds like you know, it, it, there's there's reason to, to to suggest that one is is being more difficult than the other. There's evidence, obviously, to support that. Um, yeah, my, my encouragement would be, um, and I think it's already kind of in the question itself when you say that counsel is needed. Um, there, you know, bad behavior always comes from somewhere, and when it's difficult to love somebody, it's helpful to kind of step back and say, okay, where is this unlovable behavior coming from? Is this person feeling scared, hurt, uh, abandoned? Um, you know, what, what, what might be going on in, in their life? It takes a lot of work and it's very difficult to kind of set aside our reaction to this hurtful behavior and choose to love. Uh, it's a, it's a, a very um, deep skill of empathy, um, but it sounds like that, that's perhaps what might be asked of you, and, and it sounds like you're taking your your role as godparent very seriously, and so you you will have this this relationship with both both spouses, uh, and and perhaps that that's a posture that's being asked of you. And so sometimes even just is going in with this this mindset of, of being curious, okay, just okay. It's he's acting in this way. He's being very hurtful. I wonder where this is coming from, and that can kind of sometimes take the power out of our reaction to the hurtful behavior and, and help us to, to grow in empathy. Um, that'd be my encouragement. Yeah, it sounds like a difficult situation. So I think we just have a couple more questions here. Um, so what does spiritual director have a role in working with an individual in the healing process post-divorce? I would say, yeah, if that's uh, on your heart, if you're feeling that kind of tug to spiritual direction, absolutely, it could be very helpful. Um, with the caveat that, you know, as, as we've talked about through this presentation, um, sometimes representatives of the church can say hurtful things or, or perhaps not understand uh, the circumstances that you might be coming from uh, very well. And so um, I would just advise some, some caution and, and, and sort of go slow and uh and get a sense of of you know whether um where it's the right fit with one spiritual director or another um but absolutely the the um there's no question that the lord is in all of this i mean it's our reality it's our circumstances so he is present 
We have that, that absolute certainty. And, and that's the role of the spiritual director is to help us see him, to help us see Jesus in the midst of our circumstances. And, uh, and it's so helpful to have a, a second pair of, of eyes to, to, to help us in that way. And so uh, if that's, um, that's stirring in you, if you feel that call to kind of, um, to have that uh, as part of your spiritual life, um, it can be, can be very helpful um, if, it, if it's a good fit. That's, that's my one, one encouragement. Yes, I think this might be our last question for tonight. Sure. Uh, so as someone who was the passive player, when the church focuses on giving pastoral care to those who are civilly remarried after divorce, I can't help but to see it as enabling. What about those of us who do not get remarried and feel further victimized by the church itself when the emphasis in Amoris Laetitia seems to be on the giving, on giving the civilly remarried pastoral care? Sometimes those remarried civil marriages have caused tremendous pain to the former spouse and children. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think you're naming uh, a very real tension uh, in the church. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think, you know, I was thinking that even as, as reading Pope Francis's words, where he's naming specifically the, the divorced and the remarried, um, and whereas this evening, kind of speaking more to the divorced, separated, and the divorced and remarried. Uh, so, yeah, I really appreciate the question. And, and, and I think, I mean, yeah, what, what is said is, is so true, that there can be that, that experience of, you know, well, well, I have suffered so much by not getting remarried um, and, uh, and kind of feel a little bit sort of, I don't, I, I don't want to um, minimize uh, or give the appearance of, uh, of minimizing that experience. Um, it is very, very real suffering and takes enormous courage and enormous trust in the Lord to accept the circumstances of, of being divorced and not having an annulment and, and choosing to adhere to um, the church's teaching and uh, and the call from the Lord to uh, to remain single um, or, or in that kind of separated state. Um, that is heroic virtue. And uh, and that you have not felt supported and, and encouraged and loved by the church uh, in that, um, you know, is an injustice and, and, and a failure on our part. And, uh, and yeah, I'm and I'm I'm sorry that that's the experience uh, that that's that's um, some of what you've experienced, uh, and that's not um, that's not right. Um, and the church, it, it, you know, as 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 we've been saying uh, throughout the evening, you know, you are a, a, a valuable val val and valued member of the church, and and so. Um, uh, you know, not to lose sight of that in, in some of these other conversations. Um, yeah, I, I don't have much to say beyond just kind of acknowledging the truth of what you say. And, and, um, and it is such a difficult situation because um, we are, as a church, trying to reach out to people in, in so many different circumstances and, and, and always in the truth. Never, uh, it, it's not love if, if it doesn't include the truth and, and the truth of what you name you know, that additional pain that be, can, can be caused by a civil remarriage is very real. And, and I appreciate you naming that and, uh, and bringing that into the, the conversation this evening. Thank you so much again, Father Brian, for, for giving us your time here tonight. And, and even just for your, your pastoral presence, I really felt that um, in your presentation today. So thank you uh, very much. Um, so just a few concluding announcements before we um, finish tonight. So I'm just going to share my screen again. And there we go. Um, so again, thank you so much um, for coming here tonight, for being with us, for your questions, and um, just for, for your support uh, in, this, in this new ministry. 
Um, so we do have um, a follow-up survey that will be going out um, by email in the coming days. Um, so if you can please look out for that and, and we really do appreciate your feedback. Um, this is a new ministry in the Archdiocese and um, it, your feedback will also help us develop further programming, further support um, in the areas of separation and divorce. Um, I also want to mention that um, on our website, we actually have a list of um, both Catholic and, and Christian registered counselors. Um, so uh, the website is right there on the screen. Um, so if you feel that um, that's something that uh, af after hearing the presentation tonight, you might benefit from, um, then you can refer to our website there for um, some, some potential counselors to, to seek. Uh, also, uh, the last two events in our online series for this summer, um, the first one will be on Thursday, July 9th at 7 p.m. Um, and we'll be having an online small group discussion. And then our final event um, in, for the summer will be on July 23rd, um, also at 7 p.m. And we will be praying the rosary together. And... I also wanted to uh, just mention our, our new uh, website, Behold. Um, if you have not already been there, please do so. Uh, the registration for those two events that I just mentioned can be found there, along with many other resources to support you in your faith journey. Um, and we do plan to offer more events in the fall related to uh, divorce and separation. Um, so please uh, stay connected to us uh, through, through our website and, and through our email and social media channels. Uh, with that, Father, I'm just going to end my screen share, but can you please give us uh, a final blessing? Yeah, certainly. And thank you so much, Megan, for hosting and for uh, uh, making it all, and working behind the scenes, Faye and um, Freddie as well. Um, let us pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you for uh, the gift of, of the time this evening and and for the reminder of your presence, your constant presence and love for us in the midst of all our circumstances, um, and that unchanging disposition of your heart towards us, of, of that gaze as you look upon us as your beloved sons and daughters, created good and called by you into life in union with you. We ask in a special way your blessing upon uh, the participants of the talk this evening and uh, all who have been touched and affected by divorce and separation uh, in our church here in Vancouver and and uh, beyond. We thank you for their courage in, in, in being here and in uh, drawing close to you and seeking uh, your grace and uh, being open to your presence in, the, in their midst. We ask you to continue to bless them with that knowledge of how precious they are to you, the delight that you have in them as your beloved children, and your deep desire to continue to remain in relationship with them. And we ask your abundant blessing upon them, God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father, and thank you again, everyone, for being with us here tonight. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our future events. <laughs> Thank you very much, and God bless. God bless. Thanks.